Galatians, Ephesians. So when you find Galatians, turn to Ephesians, a few more pages over, Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to pick up sort of where I left off last Sunday because I believe it's important. Now, I am was voted world champion last year of bristling feathers. I've done it before. And I will undoubtedly do it again. Um, I don't, don't necessarily mean to do it. I'm not looking to be mean about saying some of the things I'm going to say. But obviously not everybody agrees. I will. There we go. Yeah, that neon sign would come in handy, wouldn't it? Turn the microphone on. Um, but anyway, I've... I've offended people before, sometimes unnecessarily. I've done it. My mouth has been running nonstop since fifth grade. I had a teacher, a male teacher, when I was fifth grade, Festus Elementary School. I was his favorite, and I know I was his favorite because I sat next to his desk all year long. He found out that putting me on the back row was not the thing to do with me because I wouldn't shut up. And I haven't shut up much since then. So, um, I'm going to say some things this morning by way of illustration to show you what I mean and what the Bible says. Now, um, obviously, if God says it, it's true. Amen? If man says it, may or may not be true. But if God says it, let God be true and, and every man a liar. And so this morning, I'm going to make some illustrations for you, things that happen, uh, number one, in our lives, things that happen in our churches and are happening right now. They're happening. Changes are being made. Not good changes. I like tradition. But I'm not necessarily stuck on a tradition simply because it's a tradition. But if it's a tradition that's right, then I'm all for it. I still think a lady should be called ma'am, miss or missus, a gentleman sir or mister. In, in the church, we call one another brother or sister this. I think we ought to teach that to our young people instead of talking up to the adults saying, hey, John, you know, maybe brother John would be better. Show, show respect, in other words, to an older generation. Amen. I still believe in those things. And I believe that God's word is always right. And I, I want you to look at this in Ephesians chapter six, verse 10. He said, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, not ours. We can't defeat devils. And I believe devils are as real as angels are. The Bible talks about them. The Bible speaks of them. The Bible says concerning man, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him, thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. So I believe in angels. I also believe in devils. And I believe devils are evil. And they do evil things. And I want you to look at verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Have you not found that the devil is very sneaky at what he does? He never approaches. He never announces his approach. He never tells you up front what he is intending to do. Much the same way as it is in politics. Much the same way as it is when a preacher is going to deceive people. He will never tell what he's really up to. He'll never tell you where, where he's really going until he knows he has you there. And then he's going to drop in the deception. The wiles of the devil. Who remembers Wiley Coyote? And his insane ability to be able to pick holes up and carry them and drop them in other places. My dad, that was his favorite cartoon. He would just sit there and laugh at that. 
But that's what the word while means. It means he's very subtle and very secretive about what he does. We have things happening in this world, in this country, right now. We have things going on in secret that we're paying for, but we're told we have no right to know what it is. We have congressmen who vote on bills and pass them who are told you cannot know what's in the bill until we pass it. When they pass the health care bill, we know this. That one version was presented to the House of Representatives and the night before the vote, it was significantly altered so that the final version bared little resemblance to the early version and they passed it. We know that things go on, secret meetings go on behind closed doors that do affect every aspect of our life and they will continue to do so. We also know that secret things were done in the way of cheating in this year's election. We know it happened. And we're not probably ever going to be told the truth. So put on the whole armor of God. Why? Because one of those is having your loins girt about with truth. I've been lied to before by people. I've been lied about by people. I have said things that were not true before in my life. I cannot deny that. All men are liars. The devil is the chief one of those. So to put on the whole armor of God means to be willing to listen to what the truth is, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against, number one, flesh and blood, but against principalities, number one. Number two, against powers. Number three, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. And then I want you to notice the fourth thing, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, I make mention that there are four of them. And there is a reason why. I'm going to show you something. A portion of my Bible is separated out from the rest of it. It's this part right here. Now, what I'm holding in my hand are the four most important things that you will ever learn in your life. Can I hear an amen? Because you should know what I'm doing here. What have I got here, John? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All of them telling in slightly different ways the story of our Savior Jesus Christ, what He taught, who He was, what He did for us that we cannot do for ourselves. None of us can die on the cross and save another man's soul. Nobody has that power. Only the Son of God has that power. He died. He rose again on the third day. He ascended on high. And He is with God right now, standing at His right hand. And He's the one that takes our prayers and says, Father, listen to your people. Amen. Amen. That's why when we pray, we say in Jesus' name, Amen. It's because we have only one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So these four books right here, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are, they are the center of the Bible. They are the core of the Bible. They are everything that the Old Testament is about and everything that the New Testament is about. And this story right here is the most lied about, the most maligned story of anything in the world. More lies are told about these four books than about anything that goes on in the rest of the world. Amen? There are more false teachers, more false prophets, more false doctrine, more false churches out there than there are true ones. Sad to say. And it didn't used to be that way. That's because at one time, most churches, we only had one Bible. We only had one. And while God may not have honored everything that the preacher said, he always honors what's in his word. So I want you to notice the score here is four against four. We have principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in high places. And their target is always going to be the salvation of mankind. Where will you spend eternity? That's the most important thing that there is. The election, politics, 
whether Nancy Pelosi is a liar or not, none of that compares to where you personally are going to spend your eternity after you die. Somebody say amen. Now, turn to Ephesians 1. Let me show you something else. He's going to say nearly the same thing, slightly different. I want you to, if, back, if you look back up on the screen here, it says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of the world. The first three are actually pretty close to the same. A principality spirit, as I've been explaining the last few Sundays, is a devil that is a prince over a territory. Like the prince of Persia, mentioned in the book of Daniel. The prince of Israel is Michael the archangel. The Bible says that. Um, we have a principality. There is, I believe, a devil, a spirit, over the locality of Festus, Missouri. And it's, it's an evil spirit. Are there evil things done in Festus, Missouri? There is a principality. There is, there is a spirit that holds power over people in this town. And I want you to notice now in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20, the Bible says, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. That's the four Gospels. Because in all four Gospels, Christ is raised from the dead. When he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in, in the heavenly places. And then he, and he's talking about Christ. And he said he put Christ, verse 21, far above all and count these out. Principality and power and might and dominion. Those four. And they deal with what rules over mankind. Now, I believe that in the next four years, barring the Lord himself descending from heaven with a shout, I believe that we may very well see our nation change in considerable ways. Not all at once. And certainly not overnight. But I believe that we're going to see it change because the people who will be in power want that change to take place. What is the final rule of law in our country? Dave? Final rule of law in our country? Constitution. You believe in the Constitution? I do. Amen. Right over there on that wall over there is the wording of the Second Amendment. Now, I happen to believe in that. It's part of the law of our land because I believe everybody here ought to have a right to defend themselves. Amen? And that's why we were given that, the right to defend ourselves, our family, our property. We also have that right spiritually. I can't stand between you and any spirit that wants to do harm to you. I can't physically do it for you. You have a right to defend yourself against these things with the help of Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? Say amen. Because Christ is far above all principality and power and might and dominion. Do devils have to do what Jesus tells them to do? Absolutely. Satan himself was only allowed to do against Job what God allowed him to do. And he could not do against Job what God prohibited him from. He wanted to kill Job. God wouldn't let him do it. He said, you can touch his body. You can't kill him. I won't let you kill him. And why does the devil have to worry about that? Because he knows the consequences if he doesn't. He knows the lake of fire is where he's headed. He thinks he can change that, but he can't. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And he hath put all things under his feet. Now, we used to play a game. It goes by various names. We would take a football, us boys, throw it up in the air. You ever played that game? What happens to the guy who catches the football? Huh? If they can. Like I say, we had various names for it. Okay? But... When you've got 10 guys standing on one, who's the lucky loser? The one. 
In the Bible, when something is under your feet, you own it. God told Joshua, he said, Joshua, every place that the soles of your feet touch, that will I give unto thee. God said, I'll give it to you. You'll own it. You'll control it. Does God believe in personal ownership of property? Absolutely he does, because he said, thou shalt not steal. That's how you know. Okay? That candy that I gave to D is not your candy. It's D's. And I guarantee you, if you go over there and try to take it, I wouldn't. Not only in this world, this world to come, he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So Christ is attached to his body, the church. We are attached to him. Where he goes, we go. Where he stays, we stay. What he is in authority over, he puts us in authority. He says in Romans 16, may the God of heaven bruise Satan under your feet shortly, is what he said. Now turn to Ephesians chapter 3. You're in the same book. And then we'll just turn over to Colossians, because that's in the neighborhood. Ephesians 3.10, to the intent that now under the principalities and powers. You see, he puts them together here. An earthly power, let me describe it like this. When the United States won the Revolutionary War, that meant that King George surrendered his authority over the 13 individual states. He surrendered that authority. Now, he didn't give it up lightly. He fought for it to try to keep that authority. But because of the victories that were won by Washington and others, King George finally had to surrender his power over the colonies. Do you understand that? which gave the 13 colonies then the ability to become their own power. And I think it was, um, I think it was John Adams who went while Washington was president to visit the same King George to get King George to recognize the United States as an independent power. Meaning, he no longer got to tell us what to do and what not to do. Which I'm thankful for. I'm thankful for. So we have rights in this country. Why do you think people want to leave their country and come over here? Because the power they're under, they don't like it. It's repressive. So they come over here under this earthly power so they can have a certain amount of liberty. Somebody say amen. And that's what he means. Under principalities and powers in heavenly places, these are spirits, might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Colossians 1.16 For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Now how many things do we have here so far? Heaven and earth, visible and invisible. How many things? Four things. And then he gives us a second list. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. Four more things. All things were created by him and for him. Who created the devil? God did. Did he create him knowing what he would do? He wouldn't be much of a God if he didn't. Does he know what you're going to do tomorrow? He knows it better than you do. He created him, I believe, for a reason. And I've tried to preach that reason before. Everybody here, you had a choice on whether or not you wanted to be here. Now, by the way, I appreciate you being here. I don't, I don't take it for granted that you came to this church. There are other churches you could go to. But I appreciate you being here. I appreciate all the folks that are online joining with us nearly every time we stream they have other choices there are other online churches they could attend but they've made a choice to come here does not god enable man with something that not even angels have and that is the ability to choose can dogs choose whether they want to be dogs or not no 
Do dogs and kitty cats and goldfish and possums and squirrels and deer and rabbits, fish, do they, do they get much choice in life? No. When um, Action Jackson came into my office a while ago for candy, it took him a long time. There was only like five different kinds of candy in there. And I said, just pick one. Just get one. And he picked up all of them. He had a choice, right? Do you not have a choice on whether you're going to serve God or serve sin? You have a choice, don't you? You have a choice on where you're going to spend eternity. You have a choice on whether you're going to spend eternity. Heaven or hell? Aren't you glad that God hasn't already picked that out for you? Now, he knows your choice already. But he still gives it to you. He gave it to Adam and Eve, our grandparents, in the form of two trees in the midst of the garden. The tree of life, which they had free access to, or the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which was there in front of them every day, but they were told not to eat of that fruit. So what did the devil then do? What was his, what was the role that he played? The guy who gives you the choice. Because we were talking about that a while ago, Brian, between Sunday school and church. There's rumors, all kinds of rumors floating around about the mark of the beast and how they're going to get it out to everybody. And a lot of people have it in their mind that they're going to be forced to take it or that it's going to be snuck in under the, under the door somehow and they'll accidentally take it. That's not true. The devil never told Eve to even eat the fruit. He just turned her on to it. And she made the choice to do what was wrong instead of what was right. She chose death over life. And everybody has that choice. Amen? So even though there are principalities and powers, they cannot make you do anything. They can only lead you to one of two choices, either to do right or to do wrong. And that was the introduction to the sermon. Colossians 2.15, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. And he's talking about the cross. Now, turn to 1 Kings 21. Here, here again, I've taken up a little time to introduce what I'm going to say. But I want it to make sense. I want you to understand it. 1 Kings 21, and then we'll go to prayer. And if you would, suffer with me a little bit today. I've had a, I've had a hard week this week. And um, God's been good to me throughout it. And I'm just glad to be here this morning. I really am. 1 Kings chapter 21, let's go to the Lord. Father, we ask for your grace and your blessings. And Father, we just ask for your mercy and your help. We ask you to do what you do best, and that is lighten our eyes, open up our hearts, help us to be receptive. It's not what I say, Father, that counts. It is what you say that counts. So I pray, dear God, that you would open this book to our understanding and give us that which we need. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. Now, I'm not going to read all of this. We read part of it last Sunday. The, um, 1 Kings 21 is about Naboth and his vineyard. So we defined last Sunday what the vineyard represents. Naboth has power over it. Just as, the United, just as Missouri, the government of Jefferson City has power over where we stand right now. And I'm glad I live in a state where they don't tell me you can't come to church. 
instead of being in New York or California or some other stupid place like that, we can come to God's house. Amen? Now, does the devil like that? And did he try to stop us? Because I want you to look around. Most of these pe people all got COVID all at the same time. And it happened in church. You see, just because you choose right doesn't mean the devil's going to treat you right because of it. And if you're willing to accept the devil's abuse in your life for choosing right, God says, I'll make it worth it to you. I'll make it worth it to you. And he will. So the vineyard represents our family, our home. What goes on in your home? Is that anybody else's business? Brian, what goes on in your house? Is that your neighbor's business? Is that my business? That's your dominion. That's your, that's your vineyard. And whether you pay rent or you pay in a mortgage, according to the law, nobody can just walk up and take away your house either. They can't do it because that belongs to you and nobody else has a right or authority over it. You have power over your own place. Somebody say amen. Our church, this is our vineyard. Since we do not belong to a denomination any longer, they can't tell us what we can and cannot preach. They cannot tell us what Bible to read. They cannot tell us what Sunday school literature to use. They cannot tell us what songs we can sing. They cannot tell me how many mistakes I can or cannot make on this piano over here. I'm allowed to make all of them. If you listen long enough, you'll hear them. Amen. That's our vineyard. Our country is our vineyard. That's our vineyard. And we just got sold out. Your life is your vineyard. Does not your soul matter to you? Do you not care where your soul ends up? Listen, I've got an interest in where my soul spends eternity. I was talking about hell in the lake of fire in Sunday school this morning. I still don't want to go there. 1974 is when I surrendered to Jesus for him to save me. And I did it because I didn't want to go to hell. I was nine years old. Now I'm 54 now. Don't want to go to hell. So that's our vineyard. Your vineyard, listen, is always the target of principalities, powers, Rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places, it is always the target. Now, in this story, we have Ahab who is king. Now, Ahab's the king. Shouldn't he have a right to Naboth's vineyard? No! A thousand times no! In fact, he didn't go to Naboth and say, I'm taking over your vineyard. He didn't do that. He said, sell me your vineyard. Or I'll trade you a better vineyard. But he knew he couldn't take it. He couldn't steal it from him. It was Naboth's vineyard. And he owned it. He had rights to it. And Naboth said, God forbid it me that I sell you my vineyard. Which is my inheritance. He received it from his dad. When he had a son, he was going to hand it down to his son. But at this point, he's not had a child yet. So I want you to understand what we're talking about. We're talking about your life, your soul. Does the devil try to interfere in your life to keep you from choosing Matthew, Mark, Luke, John? Every day. Every day he does. Now, Hebrews 13, 17. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls as they, that they must give an account. I will give an account. I will stand before God and give an account of every sermon I preached Every message and lesson that I taught and every idle word that I said, wrong or right, I will give an account before God and I will be judged by God on whether or not I told you the truth or not. That they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable to you. So the Bible gives us earthly rules to fall under. The rule that Naboth was operating under was the law given to Moses by God. 
Moses was told that it was anybody who received an inheritance, it was against the law for them to give it away, for them to gamble it away, or to sell it. It was to remain under their dominion, under their name, and when they died, they were then to give it to their children for an inheritance. And it was to be an everlasting. And what it is, it's a picture of your salvation. And I want to ask you this morning, is there anything, is there anything in this world that to you is worth trading in your everlasting salvation for? If you had all the alcohol, if you had all the drugs, if you had all the women, if you had all the money, it would not be worth trading in. Jesus himself said, what does the, shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and what? Lose his own soul. You've got possession of that soul right now. It's your choice what you're going to do with it. And I'm going to introduce the character of Jezebel. This is where you might get a little upset with me. But I want you to read what I have written up there on the heading there. There's always a Jezebel. You're in 1 Kings 21. I want you to look at verse 5 real quick. Look at verse 5. It's either that or go anymore. <clears throat> Amen. Uh, Jezebel's wife came to him. Jezebel, Ahab's wife. How many women named their daughters Jezebel? Did I lose my microphone? Oh, turn it back on. There we go. Who names their daughter Jezebel? <laughs> Who might call somebody else's daughter a Jezebel? <laughs> Jezebel's notorious in the Bible. And let me explain her role. Her role. What, what part she plays in all this. She's the one that's going to get the vineyard from you. And give it to your enemy. She's the one. She's the one that gets it. Does she play fair? Jezebel's wife came to him and said unto him, Why is thy spirit so sad that thou eatest no bread? And he said unto her, Because I spake unto Naboth, the Jezreelite, said unto him, Give me thy vineyard for money, or else if it please thee, I will give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give thee my vineyard. Jezebel's wife said unto him, Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Yes, he does, but he doesn't have dictatorial powers. He can't just take... By the way, communism is coming to this country. You believe that? You believe that? You know what that is? Dictatorial Jezebel power. She takes what does not belong to her. Remember Joe the plumber? Dave, you remember Joe the plumber? And he asked Obama, why do you want to take my money that I worked hard for and give it away to people who don't work? And Obama, he told the truth. He said, I believe we spread the wealth around. It's good for everybody. Not for me. It's mine. I earned it. Do not even the wages of sin belong to us. Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Rise and eat bread and let thine heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. Her role is involved in the transfer of Biblical authority and whether that again whether that is your family So let, let me let's take it right here How would a Jezebel Take over a family Who's the head of the family? Husband you see I'm old-fashioned So how would Jezebel Steal this man's wife and kids from him Turn him on to another woman. Does that work? Does that work? Turn him into a drunk. Does that work? Turn him into a wife beater. Does that work? Child abuser. Does that work? Turn him into a dope head. Does that work? See, she's got a lot of tools at her discretion. 
And she'll use every one of them or any of them or all of them to steal from that man what does not belong to her. So will a government. So will a false teacher inside of a church. They will tell you anything. They will do anything. They have a lot of tools at their discretion to steal men's souls away. So Solomon warned us. Proverbs 5, 3, he called her the strange woman. For the lips of a strange woman drop as an honeycomb. And her mouth is smoother than oil. You know who that is? But you know who that is behind the pulpit? It's a man or a woman that will tell you all you want to hear. Who will tell you how good you are. Who tell you how you can be successful at everything that you do. Who tell you that you can always be healthy, always be wealthy, and never be, never have any wants, never have any bad days. If you just think positive things, positive things will come to your life, and all that kind of witchcraft. They will tell you what you want to hear. Are there churches in this area that will tell you what you want to hear? That will tell you that you can keep your sin. And it's okay. Are there churches that will tell you that? Yes, there are. God forbid that it ever be this one. I do not come here to tell you what you want to hear unless you want to hear the truth. I do not, I do not need from, from this book for God to tell me all the nice things there are about me and give me a big bloated head. I do not need that. I need God for deal, to deal with me as a man and say, Mike, you're wrong. And you did wrong. But a strange woman will never do that. She'll lure you in. She'll sweet talk you. She'll say nice things. She'll tell you you're good looking and you're not. <laughs> Why do harlots and uh, gold diggers go after these rich old men? Because they're rich old men. <laughs> Proverbs 5.20, why would thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? Men, I've said this before, but the devil plays the trick with us and tells us that the other woman's the better woman. You know what, you know what's happening? Do you, do you understand what's going on? She is trying to convince you to leave your wife and your kids, your dominion, your vineyard. The lure of a preacher to leave his flock because he thinks another church will treat him better. That's a real, that's a real thing. And let me say, there's always a Jezebel. She is Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth in Revelation chapter 17. And by the way, in Revelation 18, I want you to look there on the screen. She's responsible for the trading of merchandise. And look at the last two, slaves and souls of men. Your soul is your vineyard. Don't sell it. Don't sell it to anybody. Your children are your vineyard. Don't sell out your children. Who's responsible for teaching your children the Bible? You are. It's not my job. It's not the government's job. And it's not the public school's job. They won't do it. It's your job. There's always a Jezebel. Now, I want to ask you a question. I mentioned the word powers a while ago. What are some of the things, and this is where you're going to help me preach for a minute, what are some of the things that hold power over people? That cause them to, to want to sell their vineyard, to want to trade it in. What are some of the things that hold power over people? Addictions. Alcohol. Does alcohol hold power over people? If you're a drunkard, can you just decide, I quit? Most people can't. It holds power over them. 
and according to the Bible, is being a drunkard, a, is that a sin? Yeah, it is. Drugs. I didn't think we'd ever see the day they put pot dispensaries in Festus, Missouri. Well, here they are. Do drugs, yes, even marijuana, does it hold power over people? Can you just, can you be on meth and just say, I'm walking away from it for the rest of my life and I'm never going to touch it again? Not even, I'm not even going to want it. You know anybody that's ever had that happen to them? Nobody. Does the lust of the eyes, does it hold power over people? I've got up here on the screen, evil communications corrupt good manners. Who, who trusts CNN? Raise your hand. I didn't think so. Why? Because they've lied to us. The local news, they've lied to us. The newspaper, they've lied to us. Preachers, pulpits, bookstores, yes, even the modern Bibles. They are deceptive powers. They hold power over people. The one time I flipped the television on last week and it was on a local news station and right out of the reporter's mouth was the baseless allegations of election fraud. Those words, baseless, Josiah. Was it baseless? They cheated! And they're lying about it. Why are they lying about it? Because they want you, if they repeat it enough, people will believe it. Evil communication. So, do you think that it's possible that your radio, your television, and your Facebook, and your Twitter account and your blogs and your YouTube videos are lying to you. Is that possible? Is it possible? Jezebel herself, what she did was, she said, here's how we're going to do it. We're going to get Naboth in town. And I've got two guys that are going to come and lie about him and accuse him of heresy. And we'll hang him. And that is exactly what happened. Evil communications corrupted good manners because the elders of the city were convinced that Naboth had in fact blasphemed God and they hung him right there in the city. And Jezebel said, there's your vineyard. Did it work? Revelation chapter 2 verse 20. Jesus said this, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel. There was even a Jezebel in the church that Jesus was addressing here in Revelation 2. That calleth herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. Listen, you will get God into a killing mood. If you are a Jezebel, if you are a Jezebel, you could be one. You could be sitting in this church today and be a Jezebel. I will kill her children with death and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Do you believe the Bible this morning? You should. And there's always a Jezebel. Always. There have been, I've been in this church since 1974. There's been one after another. And sometimes they're in female form, sometimes they're in male form. But they always try to go, try to get you away from this pulpit. No matter who's the pastor. She will always try to get you out of the Word of God. Always. And does it work? She's good at it. There's always a Jezebel. Am I wrong?
There's always a Jezebel. She's about to be the president of the United States. Now, I didn't say that wrong. I didn't say it wrong. She is an admitted Marxist, as Obama was. Marxism is contradictory to our Constitution. Does she care? No. And she will be responsible for the transfer of the authority over this country from the Constitution to a centralized rule. Do you know why I think they're wanting to defund the police in all the cities? Andy, you know what you want to know what I think? Do you really want to know what I think? Nah. Well, part of, that's partly true. To centralize the police force. Centralized police force. See, right now, Jefferson County has rule over the unincorporated areas of Jefferson County, Jer Sheriff's Department. Can the feds tell them what to do? Not really. Sheriff's the most important authority we got in this county. In the city of Festus, the city of Festus Police Department has jurisdiction over the city of Festus. They have shared jurisdiction with Crystal City and vice versa. Which means if you're in Crystal City and you're running from the cops, if you think you're running into Festus is going to save your hide, you're wrong. They're still going to arrest you and you're going to throw you in jail. Do we want a federal police department to rule over all of the cities and counties in America? See where it's going? Do you want that, Brian? I don't either. That would be wrong. But that's Jezebel. Do you understand how she works now? So let me ask you the question. How does she work in your life? I'm not going to read this now. Let's, let's close it down. Let's, let's, let's get to thinking here, okay? How does she work in Mike Hoggard's life? Because she does. How many times have I thought about running out of here? Usually Sunday night, Monday morning, every week. The devil tries to talk me into leaving. How many times the devil tried to talk you into leaving your family? Leaving your church? And again, I, I, don't, I don't think I'm the only church here that's got anything. There are other churches, decent churches you could go to. So I don't take it for granted that you have to come here. But if you choose to be in this church, I guarantee you the devil will talk you out of it. Or he'll try. And he'll send a Jezebel or two in to this church to mingle in amongst us to get you out. I cannot tell you the number of times I've seen it happen in all the years I've been here. 1974, I've been here. Not as, I wasn't pastor when I was nine, by the way. Just, they wouldn't listen to me. But I've been here a long time and I've seen a lot of people come in and out of those. By the way, those new doors are nice, amen? I've seen a lot of people come in and out of those doors. Some just go to other churches. Some to never darken a church again with their presence. That was Jezebel. They sold their vineyard. They sold their vineyard. Will you sell yours is the question. I know, how, I know what it's like to desire things in this world. Don't think I don't. 
Just because God calls a guy to a ministry, he doesn't take away all of his desires, lusts. He doesn't just pop that out, throw it away and say, okay, now you can preach. He doesn't do that with anybody that I know. He makes me like you. This is how come I know so much about what I'm talking about. I've been down this road. I know what it's like to want this, to want that, to want greener pastures. Notice that he said, I'll give you, give you money or I'll give you a better vineyard. I know what that's like. My wife and my children and these grandchildren here, they're my vineyard. And there's been a couple times I was almost talked into selling them out. What a shame. I don't ever want to do that. Because look what I have. Look at them two boys on that back pew back there, not listening to me. <laughs> Cutest things. My grandkids are way cuter than yours. I'm telling, I'm just saying it, you know. No, I don't believe that. But I would miss out on the greatest blessings I've ever had in my life. And there's nothing in this world worth that to me. When it comes to my soul and where I'm going to spend eternity, there is nothing in this world that I will trade for my soul. Think about it. I want us to have a word of prayer. I want you to bow your heads. I'm going to give you a moment to come to Jesus if you want. I'm going to give you a, a, a moment to get up, come down to one of these benches down here, and say to God, God, whatever it takes, don't let me sell my vineyard. I'm going to give you a moment to come. I'm not going to beg you. Not going to embarrass you. But if your vineyard is as precious to you as mine is to me, I don't ever want to lose it. I'd rather die. I'd be Naboth. I would rather die than lose my vineyard.